you know the passages of Scripture that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to not add to the Scripture, but pull from some other places that would probably soak meaning out of the Sermon on the Mount in a manner that which you may not have considered. And the only reason I say that is not to be arrogant about it, but because I was reading it the other day and my, my head almost exploded. I just went, I can't believe what just occurred to me about all of this. And so I get to share it. And this is, I couldn't wait to get up here to do this. Normally I have this one <clears throat> sort of a short sermon that I do here and it's not that short. And I'm not gonna do that this time. This is a little bit different. First of all, it talks about in John, John Matthew, how Jesus went up on a mountain and sat down and began to teach his disciples. It happens to be a fact that when a rabbi teaches his disciples or two rabbis get together to teach, that they, everybody in the village, everybody in the area is invited to come and listen. This is part of their educational system. This is how it works. So Jesus goes up from Capernaum. Well, Capernaum's just right over there. And is this where the Sermon on the Mount took place? We don't know. Maybe it was that hill. Maybe it was further up that ridge. Way up on the top, there's a place that's called the Mount of Beatitudes. When you get back and somebody's been to Israel, well, they'll say to you, have you been to the Mount of Beatitudes? What they're thinking is what's way up there. Now, that's a Vatican site. It's a beautiful garden. And it's absolutely nothing like the way it would have been when Jesus did his Sermon on the Mount. We're here because it would have been like this. It wouldn't have been like Disneyland up there. It would have been like this. So we're here in a, not a probable, but a possible location where this took place. And there was a lot of people. Jesus goes up there, everybody sits down and they listen. He sits down because that was typical of a rabbi. Rabbi sits down to teach and that's what happens. And he begins to speak to a group of people that I need to kind of profile for you. If you really want to get some, I don't know, the scripture, you want to see what is it saying to me? You ever ask that question to read the Bible? What's it saying to me? Well, really, the question you need to ask is before what's it saying to me, ask what's it saying to the reader? And who are the original readers? And in this case, who are the original hearers? They're peasants from this area here. Now, the fishermen down by the shore, they were peasants of various levels of economic, you might say. Uh, you, uh, disciples were pretty much middle-class people because they owned a fishing business. They were partners in it. So you know that they weren't like poor peasants that are farmers. But there are farmers and herdsmen all over these hills. As I already mentioned, a lot of them were so poor that they only ate maybe every other day. The clothes that they were wearing that day were the only clothes that they had. They didn't have a closet full of clothes or a box with clothes in them. Maybe they had one other change of clothes for special occasions, but it didn't look or smell much better than what they had on. Maybe they have sandals. Maybe they don't have sandals because they rotted off their feet and they couldn't afford to change them. Maybe they're farmers and of course they have a crop and they're going to be able to trade their crop. But wait a minute, a plague of locusts came through and ate everything. A thunderstorm like what we had the other day <clears throat> hits their crops and destroys them. Now what do they have to feed the family with? What do they have to trade with? Nothing. Oh, a bunch of Romans come through from another province somewhere and they have no regard for these people. They don't even like the Jewish people and they raid the fields. They eat up all the grain or whatever food that they're, they have there and, they, and then they take off. Suddenly you've been raided. No wonder you hate the Romans. Plus the fact that you hate the Romans. You're a Galilean. As I said before, Galileans were very, very temperamental people. <clears throat> and every rebellion that broke out under Roman Judea started here in Galilee. Every single one of them, including the Great Revolt. The people, uh, a peasant, if you stand them here, you're going to smell them about 20 feet away. Not only that, but they're probably riddled with parasites. At the ripe old age of 20 to 30, maybe their teeth are all rotted. They don't have toothbrushes. They don't have toothpaste. What do you think? What's going to happen with them? If they, maybe they had an injury as a child. They broke a bone or something. Well, it healed wrong. That's life. That's the way it is. If they have a birth defect, there's no correcting it. There's no surgery to make it right. It isn't going to happen. These people are miserable. 
Our worst day is the equivalent, perhaps, of their best day. That's just life in those days. And I could go on and on and on. You can imagine, just think about these people. It's a level of poverty that you don't really see in this world much anymore, even in the worst places of the world, as we might consider them being Westerners. And Jesus comes up here, and he has his disciples. He's handpicked them. There are other disciples, wannabes. And then there are all these peasants sitting there. And this is their condition. They're hungry. They're diseased. They probably have lost eight of the last 10 kids that they have born in their family because the infant mortality rate was 80%. Um, it's just a horribly hard life, embittered by the Romans and their tyranny and the legalists, the Pharisees and the scribes, putting all these burdens on the people. And Jesus comes up here and he says, blessed, blessed are you. Blessed are you, blessed are the, the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed, happy. What are you thinking? <laughs> what would come to mind? You've got all these beatitudes, these, oh, how happy are you. These people aren't happy. These people are on the backside of misery every day of their lives. And Jesus says, for instance, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Now, I, you heard earth, right? The word there is land. What land? Land of Israel. That's their inheritance. But the Romans have it. And how do you get it back? Pick up the sword and go after them. Blessed are the meek. Can you hear the rumblings in the crowd? What? And I mean, it goes on and on. And, the, and at one point, he does something that's extraordinary. Later on in chapter 6, he says, Now you peasants, I'm paraphrasing, but I want you to look upon your neighbor's needs and consider them as greater than your own and take care of your neighbor's needs out of your own pockets. If they're naked, you give them something to wear. If they're hungry, you give them something to eat. If they're thirsty, you give them something to drink. Well, that's going to leave you with nothing. Jesus says, don't worry about that. Your father will take care of you. In the midst of that, he says, why do you grumble about these things? Because they were. He's hearing this murmur going through this huge crowd. Because, frankly, the Sermon on the Mount was outrageous. It was truly outrageous to these people. But there were also things in it that were soaring shining, that would have also turned their heads. Now, something that Jesus said sometime, we don't know quite how long, after the Sermon on the Mount, he gave them a parable. Let me read the parable for you. I'm just going to read it outright. I'm not going to try and paraphrase this parable like I've been paraphrasing everything else. But in Luke 15, here's what he said. He said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, that's not saying, let's divide up the estate now. It's saying, I wish you were dead. I want what's coming to me from you. And the only way he was going to get that as, is as if the father died. This is enough to put a death sentence on this kid in the parable from the village in which he lived. It's, it's, it's the worst thing you could do. It's dishonorable and shame and honor are everything in this culture. You shame somebody and that family is coming after you. If you shame any member of the family, we're all one part of one big family. You shame one member of the family, you shame the whole family, we're gonna get you. That's the attitude. And so here's this son who is incredibly bad. When he does this, people hearing Jesus say this would have gone, <gasps> big gasp. Oh man, this is terrible. Nobody does that. This is a horrible kid. So the younger one said to his father, this is the younger one, not even the older one. Give me my share of the estate. So the father, he divided the prop his property between them, the older son and the younger son. 
And not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. You know the story. After he had spent everything there, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need. So he goes there and he lives in Sin City. He spends all his money on food and prostitutes, partying, drinking, whatever it is that he does. And then his resources run out. He squandered the family fortune. And then a famine breaks out in the land. And please understand this. We talk about famines. But unless you've ever been through one, you have no idea of how horrible a famine can actually be. It's not just that you have people that are hungry or swollen bellies or something like that. It's what it does to people who are suddenly to the point where they realize they're starving. They're willing to do unspeakable things to other people. And this is what you have when famines occur. Horrible things like cannibalism and by the way, even a lot worse. So when a famine comes along, it's one of the worst things that these people could ever imagine. You say that, and we would say zombie holocaust or something. You know, it's a fiction for us, for them. This is real. So he went and hired himself out to be a citizen of that country, to a citizen of that country, who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. This is a nice Jewish boy feeding pigs. To anybody listening to this, they would say, this kid just hit rock bottom. He's now feeding pigs in a Gentile land. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. What pods are those? Well, the other day, yesterday, remember Ronnie picked up a carob and he broke it open, there's a seed? There's no nutritional value to those carob pods, but that's the type of thing that's being inferred here. There are, <laughs> there's just nothing nutritious to eat. He's feeding pigs carob pods and humans can't subsist off of it. So it's horrible. And he longs to feed himself with pig food. This is a long fall for a good Jewish boy. But no one gave him anything. In verse 17, when he came to his senses, like, what have I done? He said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He is not going back to his father as a son. He's burned that bridge. But he knows that his father hires people. So here I am starving to death. I'll set out and I'll go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and he went to his father. And you know the story. But while he was still a long way off, his father, who is scanning the horizon for him every day, longing for his son to come back, saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him the line that he had memorized so he could say it right, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he doesn't get any further than that. But the father called to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. This is what the father does. When he calls his servants to bring the robe and wraps it around the son, it's not just to say, I am honoring you. It's to say, I am protecting you from the village that is about to murder you for what you just did to my family and my honor. Now you're back. Now they can kill you. When he puts that robe on him, it's like you're back in the family and you can't touch him. I have just put on a bulletproof vest on my son, in other words. That's why he does this. And then he gives him the family ring. That's the family credit card. And puts sandals on his feet. That means he's not a servant or a slave. He's going to have shoes on his feet. He's been restored as a son. Because the father who was looking for him to come back had compassion on him. And he throws his arms around him. He gives him a holy kiss. The father loves the son who went away. You know this. Then the father said, bring the fatted calf. That's not a little animal. That's like a veal and it's a big one. And it's enough to feed the whole village. Keep that in mind. 
Bring the fatted calf, kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. And so they began to celebrate. They who? Well, the family with the son, fatted calf, tells you, and the whole village. He was being restored to the whole village. The father was restoring the family honor on this horrible individual who did things that would bring on a death penalty. Do you see how far deep this parable goes? And I'm just skimming the surface of it. And this is just a parable, but you can see it. Now, I want to jump to another place in Scripture. Over in Exodus chapter 34, well, actually just prior to that, the children of Israel are in the wilderness a very short time. Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the law of God and the blueprints for the tabernacle, basically. And he comes back down, and there is the sound of war in the camp, you know. You saw the movie, right? And, of course, Joshua's waiting for him. And he goes down, and he says, it's not the sound of war, it's the sound of revelry, because Aaron had been coerced by the rest of the people to create a golden calf idol. And they said, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt, and then everybody starts worshiping this golden calf. And the language in there, once again, is very blunt language. I, keep, I hate to keep bringing this horrible type of a thought up, but it was the way you worship these gods was with an orgy. And this is an orgy that involves now about three million people. And they have gone crazy with this golden calf at the center. Moses smashes the tablets and oh God does all kinds of very interesting things and the people are set right, they repent and then God says to Moses, we're going to do it again. I want you to come up the mountain and I'm going to restore the commandments to you, the law, because he smashed the tablets. I'm going to give you a new set. And Moses said, fine, but he said, I have a, I have a request that when we get up there, would you please let me see you. And God tells him, Moses, I'm sorry. You can't see me, not in the manner in which you're requesting anyway, or you'll die. That's just the way things are. But I'll make you a deal. Obviously, I'm paraphrasing. Moses, when you come up, I'll put you into a crack in the rock up there, and then I will put my hand over you and I'll pass by in front of you. And then after I passed by in front of you, my glory is passed by, I'll remove my hand and you can see my back. Fair enough? Fair enough. So Moses goes up the mountain and this happens, Exodus 34. And as God is passing by, God's hand, whatever that looked like, whatever that was like, is over Moses and Moses is protected in this crack in the rock. As God passes by, he removes his hand, but wait, he shows himself in his entirety to Moses by proclaiming his name. What's God's name? God, I am. Wait a minute. Listen to what God said. Moses, you want to see me? Listen, you could put up a statue of God if he would allow such a thing, and you would never know him by the statue. You can see all the statues in the world, and you can see some beautiful statues of beautiful people, and they might be the Hitlers of their age. They look beautiful, they're not, they're demonic. How do you know a person by a statue or by a painting? You really can't. But you see, the Bible teaches us, that taught the Jews, not in these words, but in everything that it talks about God doing right, doing just, That God is not as God looks. God is as God does. What God says, God does. You want to know God? What does he do? This is in their minds. This is how they perceive God. Well, what's God like? What does he do? That's what he's like. So God goes by Moses and he proclaims his name. And here's what he says. I am, I am the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, giving love to the thousandth generation. In their mind, that was an inconceivable number. If you want to do literal math, we're talking 40,000 years. 
giving love to the thousands of the generation, forgiving wickedness, the worst kind of sin on all, rebellion, rebellion is, is a sin of witchcraft, that's a bad one, and just plain old sin, I just missed the mark, I just did wrong, I, just, I, did, I made a mistake, he forgives that too. Now it goes on from there, but that's the bulk of what he said. This is God. What is God like? What does he look like? Look at what he does. He's the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, giving love to the thousandth generation, forgiving wickedness, forgiving rebellion, forgiving sin. That's who he is because that's what he does. And when like a son, like the prodigal son, who is rebelled against God and is coming home and sees his father running out at him. If you were that son, how would you picture God? Coming at you with a sword, a club, a stern look on his face for rebuke and to chew you out? What do you see coming at you? The father, who is the compassionate and gracious God. He's not angry you're back, he's glad you're back slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Uh, love in the Old Testament, by the way, was extreme loyalty. It wasn't agape. It's something entirely different. Extreme, unbreakable loyalty. You can't make me go away. I'm here. That's it. Giving love to the thousandth generation, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, sin. And Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, told his guys, look, I'm going away, but I'm going to come back. Philip intervenes and he says, look, I'm not getting this. Just show us the Father and that will be enough. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. A compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, and so forth. But wait, it gets even better. Because now, on this hill, Jesus said something remarkable. When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven. Now do you know who you're praying to? And when he taught the people here to pray, and over time he gave these parables, and at the Last Supper, he equated himself with his father. You suddenly, when we pray, and we see the Lord's Prayer that was given here in the hearing of these rocks and these hills, suddenly you know who you're praying to. That's your father. That's our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And those words were said for the first time right here. Don't you love your father? And that's what I wanted to tell you here. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, O oh Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, yours is the glory, forever and ever and ever, our Father. Our Father. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.